Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Extreme Desert Challenge. In the last episode, we finally managed to somewhat stabilize our colony's food supply, and today I would like to build upon that and maybe also get ready for some additional animals. For the time being, I think our hay production is just enough to keep our four ducks Dora, Jesse, Pyroka and Sputnik fed, but as some of you mentioned in the comments of the last episode, a hauling or maybe a caravan animal would really be helpful at this point, and those generally tend to need a bit more food. Now today's episode starts off rather uneventful with some harvesting and meal making. This is, by the way, the only downside of rice in hydroponics farms. The stuff grows and matures extremely fast, and so from planting to harvest it takes just over two days. Now on the bright side, that also means that two hydroponics basins are normally enough to keep a regular colonist well fed, which with just a few more basins would then also free up a lot of regular farming space for things like hay grass for example, but also for heel root cotton or cacti. Nonetheless, we will of course not stretch ourselves too thin. As you know, hydroponics are always relying on electricity, and even if we were to plant a ton of hay grass, then not all animals can actually feed on that, so we would still require some additional ingredients to make kibble, for example, or we would have to reserve a bit of space for crops like potatoes, which are a bit more versatile. Now, all of that just to distract you from the fact that not a whole lot is happening for the first few in-game hours here, so harvesting crops could very well become the major theme for the first few minutes of this video at least. In the evening, Troy, however, finishes another small sculpture, and for a change, this one does not mock Edmo, at least not in any way that I can tell. Instead, it only displays an octopus playing chess with five combat drones. Well, who the hell knows what the artist wants to express with this, so by putting it inside of the bedroom of Troy himself, we are at least not putting the burden of interpretation on anyone else. Shortly after then, everyone's favorite event in RimWorld strikes us for the first time. An electrical conduit short circuits, our battery completely discharges, and to top it all off we have a small fire breakout. Of course, that is nothing that Steak can't handle, and to make up for the annoyance, Randy also sends us a potentially rewarding quest. Looking at the quest description, however, I am fairly confident that we are not going to take this. Yes, we were already able to take out a mechanoid cluster once, but this one comes with actual mechanoids as part of it, and without so much as a single piece of armor or things like EMP grenades, I really don't like our chances here. The rewards, by the way, are actually also nothing too crazy. If I had to choose, I would probably go for the goodwill, simply because becoming friends with the Empire could be very interesting down the line, but it is definitely not a pressing concern of ours at the moment, so maybe we will revisit this in a few days, but at this point I think we will let it expire. Now, meanwhile, a, at least for our standards, massive potato harvest is being brought into our kitchen, and with a dry thunderstorm rolling over the desert, the next event is also coming right up. It looks like a small group of elephants has wandered in, and well, with all the rice and potatoes we currently have at our disposal, the chance of being able to put some meat on the menu seems very intriguing. So let's go to work, Edmo will of course not engage the animals in close combat, instead he will exchange his thrombohorn for a hunting rifle. Steak will also come along with his heavy SMG, while Troy equips the incendiary launcher. And yes, that is definitely not the most civilized way of doing some hunting, but it does actually offer us a strategical advantage, because a burning elephant will be very occupied with itself, and not so much with those shooting at it. And as you can imagine, getting tangled up in melee combat with an elephant, that is the absolute least thing we want from this fight. Which is, by the way, also the reason we are not taking Red Hawk, as she is still under psychic suppression and has a slowed down movement speed, and even the slowdown effect of Stake's burden ability might not be enough to help her escape safely. So, here we are, Elephant Revenge has been triggered, but luckily not on the entire group, but only on these two, who are, as you can see, still very much distracted by the fire, so our plan seems to be working. Eventually then, the animals do in fact shift their attention over to us, but at that point it's a little too late. Now 
Now, unfortunately, the remaining three elephants in this group have already covered a bit of ground, and I don't think we'll be able to catch them before they make it off the map. So let's just be content with the two we have here. Steak can quickly extinguish the one that's still alive, then he can gain a few more experience points in his shooting skill, and eventually, together with Admo, he can carry an entire elephant corpse back to the base. Now, after our nightly excursions, we meet back with our colony on the next morning. Edmo can quickly bring in the remainder of the harvest, and then it's butchering time. One elephant corpse will be enough for the moment, and we're using the meat to make some pemmican here. Now, I will already say it at this point, in hindsight, that was probably a mistake. As I said earlier in the video, I think we are already growing enough crops to sustain our four colonists, so stretching it with meat really doesn't offer any benefits, it only takes away from food that our animals could eat. Now, pemmican is of course incredibly nutrient efficient, so on that end we are most definitely gaining something by mixing meat and vegetables, but alternatively we could have also made some fine meals here, which would have given every single one of our colonists a lovely little mood bonus. So, all in all, it wasn't the worst decision in the world to go with pemmican here, but knowing the rest of the video, I kind of wish I would have saved the meat for something else. As another evening rolls around, we also have another sculpture to look at, and once again, it's Edmo's turn to be the center of attention. This time, he is portrayed with a depressed look staring at some cabbages, an image that Steak and Redhawk now get to enjoy inside of their bedroom. And this actually brings me to one of the comments on the last episode, saying that this time our colonists have much more of a personality compared to our Ice Sheet series, and I honestly feel like that is true. Even Troy, who is kind of in the background for the most part, he has carved himself a bit of a role as well, not directly participating in our love triangle, but still making fun of Edmo with these art pieces. And in the end, all of these little story pieces, that is what RimWorld is all about, and if we manage to build a successful colony around it, then of course that's even better. Now, around midnight, we have another event take place, and this time it's a trade caravan. And not just any trade caravan, one of the members here is actually Troy's brother. Now, unfortunately, we don't actually get to interact with him or recruit him or anything like that. However, we can, of course, still do some trading. And since just in that moment, Red Hawk's psychic suppression also wears off, she should now be in great shape to execute a great deal for us. Now, we will only be able to sell a few old clothing items here, but we are going to purchase ourselves another female duck and also a husky. That husky will make for a great hauling animal, and yes, despite what you may think, it is actually very well suited for the desert, with a maximum comfortable temperature of 40 degrees Celsius. Now, naming-wise, we are of course once again going with the list of patrons in the naming rights tier and above, so our husky will now go by Natalie, and our duck by the name Swaggerbuns. At this point in the recording, I also kind of started to think that maybe it would have been better to go for Kibble earlier, but, well, I think we'll manage somehow. Troy is, by the way, also our dedicated animal handler, who will start the training process immediately. For those of you who watched the Ice Sheet series, you should already know how much of a relief even a small group of hauling animals can be. The rest of the morning then passes by without further interruption. We are starting to replace our stools with dining chairs now. I think we have reached a point now where that level of luxury is something we can afford. In terms of food production, we are actually also making kibble now. That will be useful for both our ducks as well as for our husky Natalie. And even though we're using rice and potatoes for this, which are normally meant for our colonists, I think we still have enough reserves not to disrupt anything here. Outside of the base, it then suddenly looks like the caravan was attacked by a fanic fox, which of course only means more meat for us, so we'll gladly take it. We are, by the way, also letting one of our duck eggs hatch here. Perhaps a female duck is inside and we can increase our stock. A male, on the other hand, would be somewhat redundant.
In the evening, then, we have comfortable chairs up all around the dining room, and at night the duck egg has in fact hatched. It is, however, not what we had hoped for. So, in the early morning, we can quickly get rid of the duckling. And yes, I am very much aware that this is certainly not an episode for all of you animal lovers out there. But believe me, with all the other stuff that this game has to offer, we have only barely seen the tip of the iceberg. Now, this last day of December here continues in rather uneventful fashion. In the afternoon, we are making use of our smelter, though, to clean up our storage room, as quite a few of the weapons inside there can actually be smelted down into steel, which is, of course, going to be much more useful for us than, let's say, the fifth pump shotgun. Other than that, though, not a whole lot happens, so we can already skip ahead to the next morning. It is still dark in the desert, as steak gets food poisoning. Now, unfortunately, we made these meals in batches here, which means it is guaranteed that the other three meals will be contaminated as well. So let's make absolutely sure that nobody eats them by putting them outside in the desert. Maybe they can even serve as a bait for a stray iguana or something like that. Our colonists, however, will not touch them ever again. Up next, Randy then sends the next event our way, and this one certainly has a bit of irony to it. Having just purchased a husky for several hundred pieces of silver, we now have Labrador Retrievers wandering in and joining the colony for free. And not only one, in total there's three of them, with the potential to make more, and of course we will gladly take them. Now for the names, we are once again going with patrons, and we are starting with Noosa, that is going to be the female, the male is then going to be Louis after patron Louis Harrington, and the second male will be named after patron Taylor Smith. Now, as the day progresses here, let us quickly talk about Huskies versus Labrador Retrievers. The irony in this event that I just mentioned stems from the fact that I actually believe that Labrador Retrievers are superior, at least as long as food production and consumption is still something to keep an eye on. Now, regarding their overall statistics, these two animals are actually very, very similar. One of the major differences is that huskies have a higher carrying capacity. However, they also come with a higher hunger rate, and the relative differences between those two stats are actually not equally balanced. So, if you strictly go by how much carrying capacity you get for the nutrition that you put in, then the Labrador Retriever is actually the more efficient animal. Now, again, later in the game, that will likely no longer be much of a concern, but at this point, I still feel like we should keep an eye on these things. Now, don't worry, this time I don't have a drastic solution planned, but I would still like to hear what you would do in this situation. Do you think we should sell the husky again as soon as we can, or should we keep it around for the sake of variety, even though it's not the most efficient? By the way, at this point, I also feel like we should set our sights on a dedicated animal handler, or at least someone who, unlike Troy, does not have researching as a second occupation, which is ideally a task that is very rarely interrupted. As it stands right now, Troy will have to take frequent breaks, however. After all, we want to see these dogs do some hauling work as fast as possible. Our strategy to have a secondary fenced-in potato field south of the base actually also pays off now, as we now have another big harvest coming in. And while all those potatoes are being hauled back to the base, another thunderstorm rolls around. But our colonists keep working, and today appears to be harvesting day, because up next is our rice field. Accompanied by a loud thunder, the royal tribute collector then also makes another pass by. But just like multiple times before, we have nothing to give. If you're wondering, by the way, for trading purposes, our dogs are currently only confined to a very small area. All that's in here are some sleeping spots and a stockpile for the kibble. That way, they will not run around all over the map, which will make training them much easier for Troy. As the next morning rolls around, we then actually see that our poisoned meals do have an effect. As I had imagined, a lone iguana just can't resist. And, well, not only does it suffer food poisoning now, Admo will also take quick care of the rest.
By the way, on what was previously our rice field, we are going to sow out potatoes now. The low soil fertility is definitely much better suited for that. And again, we already have plenty of rice coming from the hydroponics farms. And while we're on it, our small fenced in plantation further south is actually growing hay grass now. I think even in poor soil that is still more efficient than potatoes, but of course with the big limitation that it's only good for our animals. And not only that, only our ducks can actually eat raw hay. For the dogs, we would have to prepare it into kibble first. Now, interestingly enough, we can actually use duck eggs as substitutes for meat when making kibble. But as you can probably imagine, four female ducks do not nearly produce enough eggs to keep four dogs fed for long. And yeah, I know, in today's episode I'm talking a lot about food production. Part of it has to do with the fact that, thanks to hydroponics, we are really expanding in that regard. But then again, the episode has also been pretty quiet so far. And in fact, you can see it right here. Another day comes to an end, no hostiles in sight. On the next morning then, we have Edmo sow out some extra hay grass. I know our dogs won't be able to eat it, at least not straight away, but having a bit extra sure can't hurt. A few hours later then, we have good news regarding research. In between all the animal handling work, Troy has unlocked the secrets of machining, which means we can now construct a machining table that we can then use to make weapons and armor, among a few other things. Speaking of weapons, our next project will now be gunsmithing. I actually want to complete gunsmithing, blowback operation and then gun turrets as fast as possible, just because I feel like relying too much on traps for our defenses is going to be very hard on our resources, so putting up a few turrets seems like the more sensible idea to me. We are also doing a bit more smelting now for additional steel, and yes, we are letting that quest that we received earlier expire. My opinion on it hasn't changed, I still feel like it would be very risky to take it. Just before he heads off to bed, Snake then also constructs another hydroponics basin. And with that, we now have eight, so if my math is correct, that should actually be enough to feed all four of our colonists. Again though, that is not taking into account power outages and the occasional reserve here and there, but it still makes me feel like we are moving into that next stage of the playthrough, where food is slowly becoming less and less of a concern. Now, the night passes by once again uneventful, and on the next morning we are doing a little bit of defensive work. This is really not a lot, just a few sandbags and walls, but enough to hide behind and to give a few of our shooters as much cover as possible. Following that, the rest of the day remains more or less uneventful. We have good news with Husky Natalie though. She has already completed her hauling training, and as a result can now make herself useful. She is of course forbidden from the kitchen area and any other areas where we store food not meant for our animals, but apart from that she can move freely. For a change, we then also take a break from field work and cooking and instead gather some materials. Edmo can deconstruct some of the granite columns just north of the base, while Steak and Redhawk mine some steel further east. Once again, none of those tasks is interrupted until the sun sets again, and so the colony goes to sleep with now over 450 units of steel in our storage room. Now, of course, we did all of that for a good reason, as we're now going to build ourselves a machining table. Unfortunately, our secondary workshop is not quite big enough to fit it in, but we can quickly make the necessary arrangements to change that. Our effort is then rewarded with a shiny new workstation, so let's use it to finally get rid of those mechanoid corpses that have been laying around the storage room for quite some time now. Even though, and I believe this is also something that has been changed, we no longer receive plasteel and components from this, only steel. Now, of course, I'm not complaining. Steel is very likely going to be in short supply for pretty much the rest of the entire playthrough, but plasteel and components will definitely be needed as well, so when the time comes, we'll have to see about acquiring those. In the evening, we can then once again see Redhawk smelt down a few weapons that we simply have too many of. Like I said earlier, who needs five pump shotguns? The steel, on the other hand, is of course very welcome. And so, as Steak finishes the construction of yet another comfortable armchair, we can slowly start to wrap up today's episode. 
I know it was an uneventful one, and at least to me it seemed like we didn't make a lot of progress, but looking back at it now that I'm adding commentary, it really feels like we are progressing into that next stage of the game. Food is coming in, we have some dedicated haulers, our electricity setup is looking solid, so in the next few episodes I think we specifically should work on our defenses, and then maybe also on acquiring a fifth colonist, again preferably someone who can do some animal handling. But for today, let's make the cut right here. I am very happy to report that we once again have some fan art to show off. A big thank you goes out to Tofu, who sent me these drawings of Steak and Redhawk over on Facebook. It sure seems like our lovely couple has some fans in this community. So keep those coming, everyone. I am always super excited to see these things. And as long as the amount remains manageable, I will make sure to show them off in these videos as well. Now, that's it for today. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then I would of course be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.